Hi, I'm Hilary Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, we are covering a request and quite a few of you have requested that I cover this, which is great because it means quite a few of you are watching and that makes me feel good. What we're looking at today is a Mental Health Act 1983, the Mental Capacity Act 2005 and other bits of various legislation that are coming to play to help us support our vulnerable members of society. And that's whether they are victims, witnesses, suspects, whatever. It just means that we are gonna help mitigate any risk to our vulnerable members in society and everybody else as well. So um, yeah, it's really important to remember that if you are dealing with somebody who is experiencing mental ill health, that you are calm, considerate, and that you don't go in there all guns blazing, really big boots with your uniform on, walking about batons and stuff what you've got to remember is if somebody is experiencing mental ill health they might not have that same rationality that they usually have to make decisions or to understand what's happening and it can be very scary it can be unsettling and unnerving for people so just remember that and try and have a little bit of empathy so it, it does say that apparently there's one in three of us in the uk who experience mental ill health at some time in our lives and apparently there's 527 of you who watch this channel, thank you. And um, yeah, so imagine that divided by three. It's quite a lot of people, isn't it, right? So at some point in your lives, you may experience mental ill health. You may have family members and friends who experience mental ill health. And it's, try to remember that if you were in that position, how you'd want someone to deal with you. And that is how I'd like you to deal with people when you are out there policing. There's a UK charity called Mind and they do fantastic work with the police and victim support. They're supported by the Federation and ACPO and they created a document, this guide for police officers back in 2013 and that's excellent. So if you wanna get on Google and look at Mind um, Policing Guide for Mental Ill Health, it's like literally the second link down and that's fantastic. It's got all sorts of stuff about dropping centres and appropriate adults and things like that. So as you should know, if you have got somebody in police custody who you're wanting to talk to who is vulnerable, then they are entitled to an appropriate adult being there with them to help facilitate that conversation. So just please do keep that in mind. If you think that someone is experiencing mental ill health, and you are dealing with them in police custody, you need to make sure they are supported and they understand what's happening, because surely if that was you, you'd want the same. There might be two ways in which you are involved with somebody who is experiencing mental ill health, and that is through helping them get assessed. So if someone's being assessed for their mental ill health and they might be taken to a place of safety under section 136 or 135 of the Mental Health Act in 1983, or if you are obviously dealing with them through your um, crime prevention and your law enforcement capacity. So they're the, the ways in which you're probably going to be dealing with somebody with mental ill health. There's a common misconception that people experiencing mental ill health are going to be violent or um, and stuff. But, you know, a lot of the time people are just confused, maybe a little bit scared and, and fearful and unable to cope. So... Keep that in mind as well. Obviously, if you are, you need to be careful, obviously, with everybody you're dealing with. But if you can, and it's safe to do so, you might want to remove your helmet while you're talking to someone to take that barrier away. Speak in, you know, like a calm way, like I'm talking to you right now. And don't be upset if somebody doesn't want to make eye contact with you, because for, for some people with some conditions, whether that be uh, mental ill health, or a learning disability or neurodiversity, they might not want to make eye contact with you. That's all right, as long as they can understand what you're saying, or as long as you can keep that risk to a minimum while you're getting the support that you need. There are lots of symptoms of people who are experiencing mental ill health, and that could be that someone's quite um, erratic, they might be um, not making much sense, not very coherent, um, there could be a lot of ways in which people are presenting these symptoms, but you will have that training. There is a system that I used to work on back in the olden days called NCALT. So if you are in the police service, you, you'll be aware of NCALT. Um, I used to actually make some of the courses, so 
I'm really sorry <laughs> if you um, if you don't enjoy them, but you should do because they're informative. Yeah, NCAT is good, guys. Keep it up. Yeah, and that'll show you all about the symptoms and stuff to look out for. So people are upset, moving around a lot, um, maybe struggling to breathe, have a ventilator, speaking really fast like this, or really slow like this. If someone's looking disorientated, I was somewhere last week, um, I, I, <laughs> so I, I do um, martial arts, some of you may know, and um, I'm sometimes in and out of hospital breaking things. Um, and there was somebody in there who wasn't very well and they were very disorientated and they were looking for people and you could see that they were struggling with their mental health at that moment and that in fact the way the staff dealt with them was fantastic but there are obviously certain things that you look out for you think yeah that person's struggling at the moment something you could be aware of as well is that just because you know somebody who has a condition such as anxiety depression PTSD or a different ability and neurodiverse conditions such as ADHD, beyond the autism spectrum or Tourette's or something like that. If you know somebody with that condition, it doesn't mean that everybody else with that condition behaves in the same way. So we're all different. Every single person you will meet will be different. Even identical twins will behave differently. And that's because we're all unique. We're all unique little unicorns and that's fantastic. And these different conditions and things we have just make us a little bit more cool because if we're all the same, it'd be mega boring. And yeah, so if you have a cousin or a brother or maybe yourself and you have ADHD, that doesn't mean the person you're talking to who also has ADHD is the same as you. So just remember that and don't go, oh yeah, I know, I know this, you've got autism like my, my sister, does that mean you're good at maths? Do you know what I mean? It's quite insulting. And also, you could have people who have got something called comorbidity, which sounds pretty bad, but that just means you've got more than one condition. And those together can affect how we deal with people. So it might be that somebody has anxiety and depression and OCD and ADHD, and because you've got more than one. It might be that somebody has um, ADHD and um, PTSD. It, it doesn't matter, basically. You can have a lot of different conditions. and um, we just need to make sure that how we're responding to that person is what's best for them, not what's easiest for you. If somebody does have um, a learning difficulty or dis disability or, new or are neurodiverse and you are dealing with them in, in part of your role, as part of your role, you have to be conscious that in terms of the understanding and clarity in which you are speaking to people, um, it is is thorough and the, where necessary there's an appropriate adult. We've got quite a few pretty bad cases in police history where people with um, maybe limited mental capacity and things have had pretty poor treatment which has resulted in awful, awful situations. I'm going to come to a case in a little bit. Um, yeah, so just remember that if you think somebody needs a little bit of support, we can get that support. It's not hard, we get that support, we deal with people properly. Also, we need to make sure that, that information is passed on to the CPS as well. A doctor or a mental health practitioner can help you to establish whether somebody has got a, um, a learning disability, learning disability, um, or any other condition as well, if you're unsure. And of course, we've got bags of support from people like Victim Support, who can support victims witness in court. Victim support, by the way, are absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't um, big them up enough. So yeah, well done, Victim Support. If you're watching and you work at Victim Support, thanks. You guys rock. In terms of when people are acting aggressively then, so if somebody is experiencing mental ill health and they might be acting aggressively, they might be shouting, um, you know, sweating, clenching fists, uh, lashing out and things because they're scared or frightened or confused, then you've got to learn how to protect yourself and others at the scene. You should definitely try and avoid physical contact with the person unless you don't think they're going to perceive it as threatening. Sometimes if you try and, you know, calm somebody down by putting their hands on them, it might escalate stuff. So maybe give people their space, okay? And that might mean taking a step back, uh, talking slowly and calmly, but not like, can you understand? 
because that might really annoy people. It would annoy me. I think it made me even worse. Keep your hands visible. Make sure they can see what you're up to. Try not to talk on your radio because it might upset someone. They might think you're talking about them. Uh, you, you probably will be talking about them, but try not to use your radio while you're with that person because it might make things worse. And, unless you need to, unless you need some help. Do a bit of a visual check for anything dangerous, so any weapons, things like that, and try and keep anything out of the way from somebody if they're aggressive and showing those signs. And I know I mentioned earlier about take your hat off if you can, if it's safe to do so, but you know, keep a safe distance and keep it on you because you might want to put it back on. Um, but like I said, that's only if someone is aggressive. So looking out for those signs as you would with anybody. If you can, don't get hands on. And if you do need to use force, use as little force as possible, like we do anyway, proportionate, legal, gotta be accountable for it. It's got to be necessary and it has to be ethical, okay? The biggest tool in our armory is your communication. And doing so can um, you know, reduce risk for a lot of things. It is best if you're speaking to somebody who is experiencing mental ill health to be calm, speak in a low calm voice like I'm talking to you right now because what you don't want to do is come in here all aggressive because you might make somebody upset or you don't want to be really fast like this because you might be able to understand you, you might want to because if you are struggling with what's happening right now you might not be able to understand things if it's coming flying at you especially if you're hearing other stuff you've got a sensory overload cognitive overload and someone speaking to you like it's really really fast it's not going to be good for you. It's going to make you more tense and more stressed out. And also, you're not going to remember what you're hearing. So speak in a low, calm voice like this and check for some signs of understanding, maybe a head nod, if someone doesn't want to make eye contact with you. It, check for those understanding signs. And if necessary, repeat yourself, okay? It might be something like, um, Hi, Mr. Peterson. My name's Hayley and I'm here to help. If you'll just please come with me, we can get you somewhere safe and make sure that you've got everything you need, okay? It, so something like calm, reassuring, or whatever it is you're trying to do, just make sure you are calm and reassuring. Don't be going in there like, come here. Yeah. Why would you do that anyway? A person experiencing mental ill health might be quite unpredictable. Um, so just, I, although I'm asking you to be calm and low and, you know, nice and steady. Also be aware that things can change quite quickly, which I'm sure you guys are all quite responsive anyway. So do make sure that you don't completely relax into things in case something else happens. If somebody is feeling pretty unpredictable, um, they might suddenly um, engage in harmful behaviour to themselves or to somebody else or something else. So just make sure that you are aware of that. And if you do need to use force, make sure it's as little as possible just to keep everybody safe. There's thousands of people in our local community who are experiencing mental ill health right now. And that doesn't mean you get to go and do all this stuff with them because that would be really weird. The only time the police get involved is if someone's in immediate risk. And that's if their immediate safety is at risk or somebody else's. So the police do have powers to detain people. And as we know, if you detain somebody, you are affecting Article 5 of the Human Rights Act. And that's, you know, the, the right to liberty. And if you're detaining somebody, you're, you're engaging in that, you're affecting that right. So you need to make sure you, you, you should be doing it. And when you are exercising this power, so let's say if that person's in um, a public space and you think that there is an immediate risk to themselves or somebody else, you have the power to detain them and take them to a place of safety. And I'll get into what those are in a moment as well. Um, yeah, generally what it's not is a police cell, but there are, there are is, I'll go through that again in a minute. Um, yeah, because someone being ill shouldn't be going into a police cell. If someone breaks a leg, you wouldn't put them into a police cell. So if someone's having a, a bit of an episode with their health in any way, you know, put them in a police cell. So why would it be different for somebody who's got mental ill health? They need to go and get medical help. What I'm going to do now is read section 136 of the Mental Health Act 1983. And this is um, the piece of legislation that sits under what I've just been talking about. I'm reading it straight from 
<laughs> the Blackstone's Handbook for Policing Students. And I know I talk about this book a lot. So as I mentioned, it's not an offence to um, have mental health or be mentally disordered in the public place. I mean, we'd be, everybody would be locked up if that was the case, or at least a third of the population. However, if a person in a public place needs to be in immediate care, in need of immediate care and control, then you have the power to put them in the place of safety if you're a police officer. And that is what Section 136 of the Mental Health Act is all about. As follows, if a police officer finds in a place to which the public have access, um, so the mentally ill person can only be like arrested if they're in a place to which the public have access, such as um, streets, town centres, um, as well as privately owned spaces, so it could be like a motorway services or a railway, something like that. Somewhere where the public have, ac have access, and that's section 136, remember. A person who appears to be suffering from mental disorder and to be in immediate need of care or control. So now it's necessary for you to decide whether it's necessary to get them immediate need for care and control. It's not enough to be suffering from mental disorder alone uh, because there are considerable numbers of people with mental Ill health in our community. A police officer may remove that person to a place of safety. Um, so I don't just mean out of the way of the train, if you're at a train station, it could be a hospital or other healthcare setting. A hospital or other healthcare setting is a preferable location because as I mentioned, it's your health that we're looking at. Only on exceptional basis should you take someone to a police station um, for, for this because that might be really intimidating and they've not really done anything, not committed a crime, they're just not very well. Um, if it's necessary to do so in the interest of that person, so there's two reasons why detain that person. So if, like I mentioned, if there's a threat, a risk to them, to they need to be in immediate care and control. Uh, an example would be, um, I was in Rotherham a long time ago and there was a person walking in and out of the road um, talking um, to nobody in particular, walking in and out of the road. It's a very, very busy road and somebody went and detained him under this act because they were at risk. And also for the protection of other people. So again, if he's running in and out of that road to protect other people. So there you go, section 136. Just run through that one quite quickly again. So if a police officer finds in a place to which the public have access, like I mentioned, street, town centre, somewhere like that, or somewhere privately owned, like a, um, a railway, or what else do I say? Like a service station or something like that. A person who appears to be suffering from a mental disorder and to be in immediate need of care or control. So we need to make sure it's necessary because like I said, there's like a third of the population who have mental ill health. So you can't just be like, oh, you've got mental ill health, let's, let's take you somewhere safe. Um, a police officer may remove that person to a place of safety. Yay. Um, and that means, like I said, ideally somewhere like a hospital or a health centre or something like that where they can get help rather than a police cell. That's really an exceptional basis that you would do that. Um, if it's necessary to do so in the interest of that person, so if they're putting themselves at risk or other people, that's section 136. I hope that makes sense. So police station cells then should only be considered a place of safety if there's literally nowhere else to take them. And that's because it's much safer for them to be in police custody than it is to be out on the streets. Anybody who is under the age of 18 should never be taken to a police cell. And if they're detained there because of a lack of a suitable space, it should not be for any time longer than 24 hours. I mean, 24 hours is a long time to find someone somewhere safe to go. Um, if an offence does seem to have been committed, then of course you need to go through your duties and investigation things. But if you're interviewing somebody, make sure they have an appropriate adult, everything you need to do to ensure that that person, that vulnerable person, is supported through the process. So when you're transporting someone to a place of safety then, the best thing to do is to transport someone in um, a vehicle that is used for healthcare, like an ambulance or a paramedic's car, not a police car. Again, they're not, if they've not committed a crime, it's a bit harsh, isn't it, taking someone to this place of safety in the police car because it might make them more upset 
and more nervous. I think there's that kind of sense of calm, isn't there, when you get, um, if you're in a, an ambulance per se, because you know you're being looked after. Whereas if you're not used to dealing with the police and you're in the back of the police car, it can be quite intimidating. Um, hopefully you guys clean out your police cars because some of the ones I've been in are disgusting. Like just McDonald's chips and stuff all over them, your fingers. Obviously, if there is a um, need for a police presence to be there to, you know, enforce that safety of others, then we'll take them in a police car. But if someone's quite calm and they're going away quite nicely, then it would be a medical vehicle, hopefully, unless you need to be there to help keep control and to challenge any behaviours and stuff. Because you you're skilled to deal with this stuff, guys. Okay, so moving on then, we're looking at section 135 of the Mental Health Act 1983. We've done section 136 and we are going to get to the Mental Capacity Act, I promise. But first of all, we're going to look at section 135 and that's moving someone from a private place to a place of safety. So the police might sometimes get called to help with someone who is um, experiencing mental Ill health in a private place and needs some support and restraining them to get them to a different place of safety. You're going to need a warrant for a magistrate and an approved mental health practitioner must also be there as well. So which is very different, isn't it, from um, section 136. The warrant will authorise entry and search the person with the premises who's experiencing mental ill health and removal of them as well to somewhere safe. The police obviously can enter as well if there's a breach of the peace or to save life and limb or to prevent serious damage to property and we've covered that in a different video so I hope you remember it. So if the person needs help and doesn't really agree with it you've got to wait for the um, approved mental health practitioner to be there. When they get there the responsibility of that person goes to them because they're the health practitioner not you. Um, you've got to wait with them until nothing that happens and they might want you to wait around as well when they carry out their assessments of the person but you'll only need to be there if you think it's unsafe and you need to be there to help um you know maintain that peace and reduce any risks you're not obliged to stay there but if you feel it's best um, to help the situation then of course you can and the authorized mental health practitioner will arrange the transport to hospital like i said before you try not to take people who need help with their health um to hospital in a police car so they can only be taken against their will if they're sectioned, if they're in that um, that private place. And like I said, for section 135, you need to get a magistrate to, to sign that. But if they're sectioned, they can of course be moved to place of um, further support after that. So in terms of places of safety then, Blackstone's Policing Handbook, as you know, my favourite book, says a place of safety could include social services, residential accommodation, a hospital, an independent hospital or care home for mentally disordered persons, or any other suitable place if the occupier is willing to temporarily receive the patient. If a detained person is excluded from hospitals, which is a place of safety, and taken to a police station, the name of the person who made the exclusion decision and the reasons for it must be recorded. And obviously I've mentioned police cells as well already. Now then, when you get to your place of safety, it's not as if people are just taken there and left. They're taken there for a particular reason if you're detaining somebody on a section 135 and 136. And that's so they can get an assessment to see what they need to do next. There is a limited amount of time that you can keep somebody there for assessment. So it's 36 hours, which is 24 hours for the initial assessment. Then there's a further 12 hours um, if the assessment is ongoing or if it hasn't been possible in that time. And they can be detained in that place while they're being assessed, while they are sorting out what to do next in terms of care or if they need to be interviewed by an approved social worker. If there is someone's already in a place of safety, for example, and you're aware or you're concerned about someone being neglected or suffering from ill treatment, you can obviously do a section 135 there as well, um, or it's going and, and helping there. But it's not up to you to arrange that other place of safety. That's obviously for your mental health practitioners to do that. For you, so that's section 136 and section 135 of the Mental Health Act of 1983. So section 136, you're in a public space. Section 135, private place. Section 136, you're detaining somebody and there's a threat, a risk to their immediate safety or for somebody else and they're in need of immediate care and control. Section 135, um, you need a warrant from magistrate and also um, an approved mental health practitioner must be there. And when they get there, the responsibility passes on to them. 
Also, if you are transporting somebody in your vehicle to a place of safety, you don't just abandon them at the door and drive off. You've got to go and someone else will take responsibility for them. Um, then we've now looked at um, the places of safety. We've looked at um, what happens in police cells. And obviously I've mentioned the need for appropriate adults if you are speaking to a vulnerable person. So that's section 135 and 136. In the next video, because I appreciate it's very, very long, I'm going to look at mental capacity and then that should hopefully bring this little bit to a close. If you've got any more questions, please let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching. As always, look after yourselves, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.